here in Hiroshima together with a number of other Nobel Peace laureates and we're having a conference focused on the need to end to bring to a full end what we have in this world, what is unacceptable, namely nuclear weapons. In the end, if we analyze why do countries have nuclear weapons, it is because they believe that they face serious threats. And this leads to the logical conclusion that in order to convince those countries which have nuclear weapons to dismantle them lies in removing the threats. To put it more positively, we must promote peace. And the way to promote peace in the end, we have learned in South Africa, is that enemies must talk to each other. Those who fight against each other or who are considering to fight against each other must sit around the table and they must build trust and they must develop an understanding of each other's problems. This is what we have done in South Africa. What helped me to dismantle our nuclear weapons was the fact, firstly, that the Berlin Wall came down, that the USSR, under the leadership of President Mikhail Gorbachev, changed its attitude and no longer posed a threat to South Africa. Nonetheless, I had some resistance and I had to convince the military and some of the people in my government that it was wise because some of them believed it is an important capacity to have and that it will have the effect of frightening other people off. But I want to close this part of what I have to say with a categorical statement. There is no justification for weapons of mass destruction. In terms of international law, in terms of morality, in terms of human rights, we must rid this world of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. As Africa has become, with what I have done in South Africa, a nuclear weapon-free zone, the whole world must become a nuclear weapon-free zone. The challenge of our time is, is not to threaten each other with destruction, but to address what I regard as the single biggest problem in this world. And that is that 2 billion of the 7 billion people on this earth are living beneath the breadline. They're poor, they're hungry, they are suffering. And the second big challenge of our time is how to manage diversity. Globalization, all countries in the world are beginning to have important minorities within the same country. More than half the countries of the world, there are now, apart from the dominant cultural group, groups comprising more than 10% of the total population which has a different culture. And the wars of this century is no longer between countries, it's between people living in the same country. If we want peace in more and more countries, we'll have to convince people to show tolerance towards each other, to understand each other and to find ways of living peacefully together although they differ ethnically or culturally or religiously. The time has arrived and the youth, the young people to whom this century belong, the time has arrived to concentrate on promoting peace much more actively and on helping people to rise out of the poverty and the unemployment and the lack of education under which so many suffer. That, I think, is the challenge of the young people here today.
The second one, Hiroshima University, affiliated school. And Kiyomi Nagaoka is her name, the second grade. I'm very honored to see you today. My question. And together with Ms. Amandana, we abolished about hate. I'm sure the white people in South Africa were against that and other obstacles and resistance. How did you overcome such difficulties? When I was young, what I supported when I supported apartheid was not the suppression of black people. What we proposed was that each of the nations in South Africa should have their own countries and govern themselves. South Africa's population is not just black and white. We have 11 official languages. So if you look at the black population, there are nine distinguishable different nations, cultural groups, each with their own language, each with their own history, each with their own, own character and traditions. So the uh, original plan of apartheid was the same that the world now says it's the right solution for Israel and Palestine. The world is saying Israelis should have an own country, Israel, and the Palestinians should have an own country next to it, Palestine. So we said there should be a country for the whites, there should be a country for the Zulus, there should be a country for the Sutus and all the other groups, each one their own country. But we failed. We failed for three reasons. The one is the whites was too selfish, they wanted to keep too much land for themselves. The second is, the majority of blacks said, that is not how we want our political rights. And the third is, we became all of us, whether we black or white, economically interdependent. We needed each other. So we reached a stage in the late 1970s and the early 1980s that as a government, we had to say to ourselves, we have failed to bring justice to everybody in South Africa through the route of separate development. And having admitted to ourselves that failure, we also had to admit that the situation as it was, was morally indefensible, it was wrong. We then accepted the need for fundamental reform, going to the root of matters, changing everything fundamentally. And the majority of whites agreed with us in government. But the young lady is right. There were many, many whites who wanted to cling to the old dispensation. So I constantly, when I became the leader of my party and then the president, had to make sure that I continue to convince a majority of the whites to support the reforms. And after I announced on the 2nd of February 1990, the major reforms, we started to get very strong opposition from the right wing in the white community. And they accused me that I did not have a mandate to release Mandela and to do all the things I did afterwards. So at the beginning of 1992, I called a referendum amongst the whites. And I said, now you, you've seen everything I've done you know where I'm going to. Now I ask you for a mandate. And, and we worked very hard to convince them to vote, yes, go ahead. And when they were confronted with this question, do we go ahead or do we cling to the past? 70% of the whites said, yes, go ahead. From this is a lesson to be learned about leadership. Leaders must not just ask, what do my people want? Leaders must develop a vision, what will be best for their people. And then in a democracy, they must convince a majority of their people to accept that vision. 
and then they must develop, leaders must develop an action plan how to implement that vision, how to make it a reality. This is, and I'm thankful for it, and I say it with humility, this is what we've done in South Africa.